Mr. Brennan, Peers defied ministers by 358 to 256 to guarantee the rights of EU nationals living in the UK after Brexit. What is your opinion on that? I think the House of Lords decision to go against the government recommendation to vote down the um, situation around EU citizens was, was the right decision by the, the House of Lords. Um, I don't think there's any intention from the House of Lords to prevent the government from triggering Article 50. I mean, the House of Lords recognise as the same as the House of Commons, the result of the rec referendum and that Britain's going to be leaving the European Union, alas, um, and that in the House of Commons there was an opportunity which wasn't taken by the MEP MPs because there wasn't enough votes. But in the House of Lords they have voted to amend um, the decision. That doesn't mean oppose the decision, it means exactly that, to amend it. So the amendment is around um, trying to send a signal to those literally millions of European Union citizens living and working in the United Kingdom that they will be able to remain here after Brexit. So I personally think that was the right decision um, by the House of Lords, but I think it would be wrong to describe that, and certainly sections of the right-wing media have tried to describe that is the House of Lords opposing the will of the people. That's not the case. The House of Lords recognises that we're going to be leaving the European Union. They will vote to trigger Article 50. However, they are taking up their democratic right to amend the legislation from the House of Commons. And in this case, is is to add an amendment to say that EU citizens should be able to stay in the UK. And I think that's perfectly fair. What will be the immediate consequences once we leave the European Union? For example, drop of the pound or visa for those travelling within the European Union from and to the United Kingdom? I think the reality is um, because no country has ever left the European Union before, um, the reality is we don't know what's going to happen when we leave. Um, it's uh, surrounded um, in uncertainty certain things may happen or may not happen and I don't think we're going to find out until we, we actually begin the process of leaving. Um, we do know um, that a lot of EU citizens who are living and working here are very worried um, and that is triggering messages back into the wider European Union that this is not a particularly good time to take the decision to move to the, European, move to the United Kingdom. So we have employers out there across the northeast of England who have skills gaps, who are trying to recruit from overseas, from elsewhere in the European Union to bring people in. And the worry is that they're not going to be able to fill those skills gaps um, because members of the European Union living in the other 27 member states looking at the United Kingdom thinking this is not a good place to come at the moment until the uncertainty around um, citizenship is um, rectified. And I don't think it's going to be rectified until we've left the European Union. I think that's partly why it was a good idea um, for the House of Lords to try and amend what the government's doing over Brexit is to send that signal to say you are still welcome to come here and you're welcome to stay here because I think there's a danger that we're now going to go into a period of one, two, three years when it's going to be difficult to recruit um, skilled labour from elsewhere in the European Union. That's going to be bad for the economy. And I think at a university level, I think we'll see a downturn in the number of students applying from EU countries to come and study here. To some extent, that might be filled from over by overseas students from elsewhere in the world. But uh, if I was um, Sunderland University or Newcastle University or Durham University, I'd be worried that we're going to see a downturn in student applications from across the EU um, in this coming, for this coming academic year, which I think is bad news for our universities. What would you say to EU students who may currently be worried about their future if Article 50 is triggered? If you're already here, I think there's very little to worry about. I think the terms of the arrangement in which you've come here, your fee level, etc., will be honoured by the university. So say you were a first-year student on a three-year course. Um, by the time you get into your third year, we could well have left the European Union. I think you'll still be paying the same level of fees. You won't be paying an overseas student's level, which would be pretty much double what you currently pay as an EU citizen, being treated the same as a home student. Um, I think if you're a student um, in the European Union thinking of coming here, I would encourage you still to do that um, because I think individual universities are likely to guarantee fee level um, 
from the moment you arrive for the three, four, five years of your course. So therefore, if you came in on a fee which was the same as a UK student, um, then I think you could be fairly certain that the university would honour that. Will they be able to apply for tuition fees loans? Well, my understanding is that most of the British universities will make it very clear to students applying from elsewhere in the European Union that you will be treated the same as a home student when it comes to fee levels for the year you come and for the two, three, four, five years that you remain here thereafter. So I think there's a security around that um, in the short term. In the longer term, um, we'll have to wait and see. What do you think the plan should be for EU nationals living and working in the United Kingdom? Um, I understand the argument that says EU nationals living here are going to inevitably be drawn into becoming in some ways a bargaining chip in relation to UK citizens living elsewhere in the U EU. So obviously as the British government they um, want to have a situation where our nationals are able to continue to live and work and be retired in other EU countries and therefore I can understand the temptation that therefore let's have that as part of the negotiation. So therefore let's not give a guarantee at the moment to EU citizens here in the UK. Uh, I understand that argument but I think it's, it's, it's a mistake. I think that we should be magnanimous, we're the ones who are leaving after all, and we should say irrespective of what happens in the negotiations, we're here by giving a guarantee that those EU nationals who are already living and working here can stay as long as they want to. Um, and I think we should do that as a gesture of goodwill. That then takes us into a series of negotiations where hopefully our EU colleagues say that the British, they've already made, um, if you like, a concession around our nationals resident there, we should respond as early as possible with a similar response because I think for whether you're an EU citizen living in the UK or UK citizen living in the EU what both want is as per a period of as little uncertainty as possible so if they're going to have to wait two three years to find out the situation that's a long time to be worried for however the British government could send a signal within the next two three weeks before we trigger article 50 that EU citizens already here can stay here. That would be a positive signal and that would end all of that worry for those. And then hopefully we'd get a quicker response from our European colleagues about our nationals living elsewhere in the EU. So this could affect this part of the negotiation could all be sorted out within six months. However, if we do what the British government are currently asking, it's going to take up to two years before we have clarity or maybe even longer. And what about the UK nationals living and working in the European Union? What do you think the plan should be for them? I think the UK government should be doing its very best in the negotiations with the EU 27 remaining member states to try and ensure that British citizens um, in countries like France, Germany, Spain, who are living and working there can continue to live and work there. And for the very large number of British people retired, particularly in Spain and France, that they can continue to live there. Um, I'm sure that the British government have every intention of doing that. I would argue to the British government you've got a better chance of securing that aim if you were to move first and offer a guarantee for EU citizens currently living, working, studying in the United Kingdom that they have a right to remain. I think you're more likely then to get what we want from our European colleagues as regards our nationals living elsewhere in the European Union. I think that if the British government guaranteed the rights of EU nationals who are currently in the UK to continue to live, work, be retired here if they've got the financial ability to look after themselves and most of them do and also if you're here as a student that you would be guaranteed your right to remain um, after Brexit that I think would send absolutely the right signal to other European Union countries to do a similar response and allow our citizens to stay in those countries living, working and being retired there if that's what they want to do. So in your opinion, will Britain keep the same route after Brexit and follow the EU policies on the environmental issues? Well, this is one of the interesting debates we're now heading into. Um, what happens when we leave about existing EU legislation? So the government are talking about a great repeal bill um, I think that's 
a wrongly named bill because we're not going to repeal anything. We're, it's more a case as a great absorption bill. And we're going to absorb into British law all of the existing EU law that we're signed up to. So it would be a bringing in um, rather than any kind of repealing. So we would bring it into British law. So in the short to medium term, we would continue to follow all of the European environmental laws, which I think would be a good thing. We then have the opportunity to go through the British Parliament and decide over a period of what will be several years, which of the European pieces of legislation we want to keep, which we want to um, change or reform. Now, if we do anything around the environmental rules, I hope that what we would be doing would be we'd be improving on them or making them stronger or a combination of the two, that we wouldn't in any way be reducing um, environmental levels um, and allowing more pollution to happen or make it easier for um, in any way bad behaviour in relation to the environment. So we would like to see it either all remain at the very least or all be improved upon. Um, but it, it isn't going to happen overnight so I don't think anything will happen in the short to medium term. It will be over the longer term. Where there will be a relatively quick discussion I think is around subsidies for farmers because that's a very large part of what we currently pay into the European Union to do. So we pay our money in and it's the single biggest item within the, the European Union budget is the subsidy for farmers. So British farmers want to continue to receive a subsidy. There's a strong case for them to do so but only in return for them looking after the environment looking after the environment and that's what the discussion needs to be around is um, what are the environmental practices we would like British farmers to continue to carry out or maybe some new ones as well in relation to them being subsidised by the British taxpayer and that is something that needs to happen in relatively quickly because the British government have only guaranteed that the subsidy to farmers would remain until 2020 so what happens in 2021 2022 will need to move fairly quickly on that. But there's an opportunity on leaving the European Union to improve the environment, but if we get it wrong we could go backwards and we could damage the environment. I'm very much on the side of the argument that I hope that as a result of being outside of the European Union one of the things we could do is improve the environment, we could have stronger environmental legislation. Do you believe that the money the government gives towards the European Union could be spent to the NHS or elsewhere? Well, it was hugely debated during the referendum campaign um, as to whether or not there would be any money available or any extra money if we left the European Union um, or if there were to be any, how would we spend it? Um, I think until we have left, um, we're not going to be absolutely certain that there is a financial gain. Um, it could be that the economic downside of leaving the European Union um, is dealt with by using the saved money from leaving the European Union so that actually becomes a zero-sum game and we end up with no extra money. Um, we may have a little bit of extra money because we were a net contributor into the European Union um, but we're going through a period of austerity here in the United Kingdom. Money is very tight um, so it isn't going to really feel like extra money, it's just going to maybe feel like the cuts weren't as severe as they might have been rather than there's no cuts and there's extra spending. Um, so clearly there'll be a strong case for some of that money going into the health service and into social services in particular, looking after elderly people in their homes. Um, local authorities, councils like Sunderland have had big cuts to their budgets. These are the kind of areas that have been cut to care for the elderly in their homes that will be where there's an argument for extra money to go if there is any extra money left. But we'll have to wait and see. I think there's great uncertainty and it could be that the economic downturn that many of us think will happen when we leave the European Union um, will quickly eat into any money that we've saved as a result of leaving. Do you think that the outcome of the referendum would have been different if 16 and 17 year olds could have voted? Um, almost certainly yes. Um, all the evidence is that the younger people were, the more they were inclined to vote for staying in the European Union and that older people were more inclined to vote to leave. And that if the 16 and 17 year old tranche of the population had had the vote, which is what the Labour Party argued for, 
um, then it would have made a difference because at the end of the day it was very close. It was you know, 48 to 52 percent. There was a, a relatively small um, club. I mean, it's not, it wouldn't be the case that all young people would have voted um, to stay, but the majority would have done and it could have swung it. Um, and so I think it's a great shame that young people aged 16 and 17 didn't have the vote. They've got, all things being equal, the longest future ahead of them. Whereas the old, you know, people over 80 um, who voted to leave the European Union, you know, the demographics are such that they don't have much of a life in front of them at the end of their lives. So they've taken a decision and then will be gone, leaving young people to deal with what many of us think will be rather a mess. Um, and that seems unfair, but we didn't get, we lost that argument. Um, and uh, we're in the situation we're now in. So eventually, Mr. Brannan, do you think that Britain will gain things from leaving the European Union and that this was the right choice for the future of the United Kingdom? Well, now that we've taken the decision to leave, which was one that I and the Labour Party didn't support, um, however, that was a referendum, it was a decision, albeit close, taken by the British people. And unless the British people change their mind, and I think they're entitled to do that, but as it currently stands, I, don't, I think if the referendum was held again this week, it would be a similar kind of result. I don't think there's been a big shift. Um, but if we go through the next two or three years and there's no indication that there's been a big shift against the idea of leaving, then what we have to all do is do our collective best, whichever side of the argument we are on, to try and make the most and the best of leaving the European Union. Um, it's nonsensical to deliberately say we're going to make a mess of leaving because we disagreed with the idea of leaving. Um, the people who would suffer the most from that are the poorest people in society or the people that the Labour Party was set up in the first place to um, campaign and look after in that state sense. Um, so therefore, given the people we represent, the communities we represent, we need to new, uh, do our very best now in the situation in which we find ourselves, so we need to leave on the best possible terms. And there will be opportunities um, for leaving, so um, when it comes to the environment, we could decide to have higher environmental standards in the United Kingdom. We could go that bit further in tackling climate change. Um, and therefore, it, there is an opportunity for being, when we're outside of the European Union, to be the forerunner on some of the things which hopefully then, if the rest of the European Union looked to Britain and said, well, that's interesting to see what they've done environmentally over the last three years. That seems to have had a good impact on the economy. It seems, to, why don't we follow a similar route? The danger is the opposite happens is that we make take it as an opportunity to drop standards whether it's standards to do with workers rights or standards to do with the environment thinking that that will um, in some way translate into some kind of economic advantage that will annoy our european uh, sister countries um, if we start to try and undercut them on wages or on environmental standards or on workers rights um, and I think that would be the wrong road to go down. Clearly some people are advocating that, um, but I think we want to try and do is to, to either match the standards that exist at the European Union level or to improve on those standards um, across the piece. Something to deviate from Brexit. I would like your comment on the statement that the Polish MEP made, namely that uh, women should not be treated the same way as men because they are not equal. So in the... European Parliament, there's over 750 members of the European Parliament from uh, the 28 different member states. And because a form of proportional representation is used in every country, this means that um, maybe unlike the Westminster Parliament, where it's first past the post, um, as a result of the PR system used at the European level, it does allow small extremist parties and individuals to get elected to the Parliament. Um, so there are both people on the far right who have been elected to the European Parliament, relatively small numbers, but they're out and out fascist or neo-fascist. And there are also a very small number of people on the far left who are...